In this video I want to explore some six-dimensional shapes, but how can we draw them on a screen? I mean, there should probably be a way to represent a six-dimensional shape on a two-dimensional screen or at least some parts of such a shape. And even if we can draw them on a screen, how do we construct such shapes? I already made a video about four-dimensional shapes, but it was more than two years ago. So I'm going to revisit some concepts with new animations. I hope it will help to visualize these shapes a little better. So first, let's draw a four-dimensional cube. We can start with a line segment, then extend it into the second dimension to form a square. Next. We extend the square into the third dimension to create a cube. Finally, by extending a three-dimensional cube, we can construct a four-dimensional hypercube or tesseract. But why does a tesseract appear like a three-dimensional object that constantly changes its shape? To better understand this, let's compare it to a three-dimensional cube intersecting a two-dimensional plane. The intersection of this rotating cube with the plane produces a square that morphs into a hexagon and then back into a square. Similarly, a three-dimensional slice of a rotating four-dimensional tesseract looks like this. Now let's take a rotating cylinder as another example. Its intersection with the plane appears as a circle that morphs into a square and then back into a circle. In theory, we can learn about properties of a 3D cylinder just by observing those two-dimensional slices. And since we can't directly visualize four-dimensional shapes, let's explore three-dimensional slices of those shapes. A regular three-dimensional cylinder can be created by extruding a disk. So let's try to create a four-dimensional cylinder by extruding a three-dimensional ball. The resulting shape is called a spherender. What you see here is a three-dimensional slice of a rotating spherender. Another way to visualize a four-dimensional object is to move it along the fourth axis as it passes through our three-dimensional space. Let's also compare it to how a three-dimensional object passes through a two-dimensional plane. For example, a ball would appear as a circle that grows and then shrinks. This is similar to how a 4D ball would pass through our space. So we are basically using time here as a fourth dimension, but I think it's it's easier to understand those shapes not when the slice moves, but when we can observe multiple slices at the same time. For example, here are the two-dimensional slices of a three-dimensional ball. These are the slices of a cylinder. And here are the slices of a spherender, a four-dimensional cylinder. You can imagine a four-dimensional space as different three-dimensional worlds existing in parallel to each other, with four-dimensional objects spanning across those worlds. Each slice of such a shape would be a cross-section with a particular world. For example, here I've extended a three-dimensional ball into the fourth dimension. In this case, the ball repeats across these worlds. Similarly, in a three-dimensional cylinder, a two-dimensional disk repeats along the third dimension. But with a ball, the situation is different, because its slices have different sizes, smaller at the ends and larger in the middle. The same logic applies to a 4D ball, so its slices are also different in size. And it can also be applied to a cylinder if the cylinder is rotated. Similarly, the slices of a spherender also change if the spherender is rotated. A spherender, which is created by extending a 3D ball into the fourth dimension, is not the only type of four-dimensional cylinder. For example, we can extend a regular 3D cylinder into the fourth dimension to create a cubender. When the cubender rotates, it looks like this. And here are the slices of a cubender. And if we rotate the entire four-dimensional shape, its three-dimensional slices will look like this. 
In the previous video, I demonstrated how to create these four dimensional shapes using two operations extrusion, represented here by an arrow pointing to the left, and revolution, represented here by an arrow pointing to the right. Let's talk about revolution operation a bit later, because there are many other things to explore with extrusion. For example, we can obtain all these shapes just by extruding n dimensional balls. A one-dimensional ball is simply a line segment. Extruding a line segment gives us a square. Extruding a square gives us a cube, and extending a cube gives us a tesseract. A two-dimensional ball is a disk. Extruding a disk results in a cylinder, and extruding a cylinder gives us a cubender. Finally, extruding a 3D ball results in a spherender. As you might have noticed, each time we perform an extrusion of a shape, it increases the shape's dimensions by one. However, there is also a multi-dimensional extrusion, which takes two shapes as input. Let's examine the simplest case. Take these two line segments, for example. The first line segment exists only along the x-axis, so it doesn't define any y-values. If we extend it by including all the y-values, it would become an infinitely long stripe. On the other hand, the second line segment exists only along the y-axis, so it doesn't define any x-values. If we extend it to include all the x-values and get the intersection of these two infinite stripes, the result we get is a rectangle, or a square, which represents the simplest case of a Cartesian product. Now let's consider a second example, a two-dimensional disk and a one-dimensional line. The disk exists in the x-y plane, so it doesn't define any z-values. By extending it to include all the z-values, it becomes an infinite cylinder. Meanwhile, the line segment exists only along the z-axis, and doesn't define any x or y values. If we extend it to include all x and all y values, we get an infinite slice of 3D space. The intersection of this infinite slice with the infinite cylinder, obtained by extending a disk, produces a regular cylinder. Here the same shapes I showed earlier, but obtained through the Cartesian product. A square, a cube, a cylinder, a a tesseract, a cubender, and a spherender. However, these are not the only shapes we can create. For instance, let's take the Cartesian product of two disks. It would look like this and result in this shape, called a Steinmetz solid, which apparently you can roll like a sphere, but it is not four-dimensional. The reason is that these two disks have only three dimensions in total. The first one exists in the x-y plane, and the second one exists in the y yz plane, so they share the y-axis. To avoid this overlap, we should take two disks that exist in completely separate dimensions, as shown here. The Cartesian product of these disks results in a duo cylinder. Here you can see a rotating duo cylinder. If a duo cylinder passes through our three-dimensional space, it would appear like this. And these are the slices of a duo cylinder. Like extrusion, the Cartesian product has a nice property. It can be applied to any shapes in any number of dimensions. For example, here is a Cartesian product of two hexagons, and here is a Cartesian product of two two-dimensional stars. Since this method works in any number of dimensions, we can extend it further to generate five-dimensional shapes. But how can we visualize them in a way that makes sense? First, let's try taking a sequence of three-dimensional slices of a four-dimensional shape. Then we can apply rotation to the entire five-dimensional shape, allowing us to see familiar three-dimensional shapes in a sequence that represents the fourth dimension. 
and time in this case could help us visualize the fifth dimension. For example, here is a Cartesian product of a four-dimensional ball with a line segment. This is essentially the same as extruding a four-dimensional ball into the fifth dimension. However, I find such a visualization difficult to understand. So let's try another approach. What if instead of making a sequence of slices, we create a table of such slices. It might sound even more complicated, but let's take a look. These are slices of the same shape I showed you a few seconds ago. And here we can clearly see some familiar patterns. For example, we can observe that every row of the table is a four-dimensional ball. And these balls simply repeat into the fifth dimension. If we take a column, it would be a four-dimensional spherender. Similarly, if we take a three-dimensional shape, it may look like different two-dimensional shapes from different angles. A four-dimensional shape appears as different three-dimensional shapes, depending on the perspective or the orientation of the cross-section. Extending this logic, a five-dimensional shape would appear as different four-dimensional shapes. And here we can see slices along the fourth axis and along the fifth axis. But in fact, it is just a one continuous shape. It's just divided into different slices so we can see different parts of this five-dimensional object. Now let's take a look at few other shapes. Here we have a three-dimensional ball extended into the fourth dimension and then further extended into the fifth dimension. Alternatively, we can describe it as a Cartesian product of a three-dimensional ball and a two-dimensional square. And this is simply a five-dimensional ball. Next, we have an extruded dual cylinder. You can notice that the extrusion simply extends and repeats the shape into a new dimension. And here is a five-dimensional analog of a dual cylinder, a Cartesian product of a 2D disk and a 3D ball. But what happens if we swap them? We get the Cartesian product of a ball and a disk. You may notice that the slices of the shape are spherenders. And if we rotate the entire shape, we can see those spherenders more clearly. But wait, I showed you both the Cartesian product of a ball and a disc and a disc and a ball. Shouldn't they be the same shape? And indeed they are. They are actually the same shape, just rotated differently. If we rotate it, we can see it. About a minute ago I showed this shape. If we slice it along the fourth dimension, it appears as spherenders. And if we slice it along the fifth dimension, it also appears as spherenders. Let's try rotating it. And yes, we can see the spherenders here. And if we rotate it at a different angle, it looks like a circular arrangement of cuboids. Ok, now instead of those five-dimensional shapes, let's create some six-dimensional ones. For example, this is a six-dimensional analog of a dual cylinder, which is a Cartesian product of two three-dimensional balls. We can also show it as a table and add time to this table view to make it rotate so it looks like this. But we can do better. What if we create a three-dimensional matrix of those slices? Since this shape is a product of two balls, we can represent it as three-dimensional space where each point is also a ball. We can also rotate the whole shape. And now it looks like a cylinder made of cylinders. So far I been showing you shapes created using the Cartesian product. Now let's explore another operation, the revolution of a shape. By revolving a shape, we can also make it extend into a new dimension. In my last video I mentioned that we can create a cubender, a spherender or a three-dimensional ball using revolution, but not a dual cylinder. However, it turns out that we can create a dual cylinder this way. The issue is that the method I used for the revolution isn't perfect geometric revolution. It's more like transforming the space into a shape and then creating a new shape within that space. But actually such approach allows us to create much more shapes. For example, let's take a look at this solid torus. It's a two-dimensional disk revolved around a circle. But we don't have to use circles. We can replace them with squares or hexagons, for instance. 
We can also mix different shapes, like revolving a hexagon around a square or a circle around a hexagon. The same concept applies in four dimensions, just by adding another layer. We can create a shape where a circle revolves around a circle, which revolves around another circle. Or we can do the same with squares or hexagons. A square around a square around a square, or a hexagon around a hexagon around a hexagon. We can even make a six-dimensional torus. And this is how it looks when it rotates in different planes. In a matrix view, I expected it to look very complex, but surprisingly, it just looks like a loaf of bread made of tori. But if you want something truly complicated, take a look at the 8-dimensional torus. There is also a special type of 4-dimensional torus called a tiger. We can create it by taking the Cartesian product of two circles and then expanding the resulting shape, otherwise it would be just infinitely thin line. These are the slices of a tiger, and it looks more interesting if we rotate it by 45 degrees. If we instead take the Cartesian product of a sphere and a circle, we get a 5-dimensional analog of a tiger. In six dimensions, we can, for example, take the Cartesian product of two spheres, and when we rotate the six-dimensional tiger, it resembles the four-dimensional one. The matrix representation of its shape looks like this. Essentially, a sphere made of spheres. I wanted to create a more complex shape, so I decided to take a Cartesian product of two tori. And this is the result. Since it is a Cartesian product of two tori, in the matrix view it looks like a torus, where each point is itself a torus. Another way to create something similar to a tiger but in six dimensions is by taking the Cartesian products of three circles. When we rotate this shape as it passes through our three-dimensional space, it looks like this. And in the matrix view, it appears as a kind of tube made of tori. And finally, before this video ends, let's take a look at this cross-section of a rotating 10-dimensional cube. While it is rotating, if you like this video, you can press the like button, subscribe to this channel, and thank you for watching!